So with, with that being said, we have this morning's webinar, which is called No Going Back, the World of Work Post-COVID. And, and this morning's we webinar is particularly important for, for two reasons. Um, in, in particular, uh, for the day that it that we, we have, um, that it's May Day, obviously this is a day of, of significant importance, both uh, within Ireland and internationally for workers. Um, and it's particularly important that, that as, a, as a section of the party that we have um, events that, that mark and, and commemorate uh, issues that um, affect workers, but in particular what the trade union movement are, are actively uh, doing on, on behalf to improve uh, the lot for workers. Um, but equally, it's particularly important that as a section, um, we obviously we believe that the party should act as the political wing to the trade union movement. Um, just the second important reason for this morning's webinar is obviously to talk about the, the whole area of the world of work. In particular, over the past 14 months, there's obviously been significant changes as to how we do work um, and, and what that format uh, t takes in terms of uh, there's a significant number of people working from home, but yet there's a number of people who've never had that opportunity to be able to work from home. The whole area of essential work, essential services have been redefined and real value placed on uh, retail workers, refuge workers, um, and a broadening out of how we value work within society. Um, and on that basis, we thought it was particularly important to, to connect the, the position of, of today's event to the No Going Back document that was produced by the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And Patricia King is here from ICTU and hopefully we'll cover some of the um, material in the No Going Back document. And it's actually something we might circulate to all per, uh, attendees after this event as well. But just to introduce today's panel, um, we and I'm I'm going to be here in my capacity to moderate the panel if that's okay. But we have um, Eilish Balf, who's an early years educator and professional and a big start campaigner. Um, we have Luke Crowley Holland, who is a hospitality worker and a local area rep for the Labour Party in 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 Kerry. Um, we have Marie Sherlock, who is the Labour Party spokesperson on employment affairs. Um, Patricia King, who's the General Secretary of, of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. So just in terms of the format, we have about half an hour for a panel discussion. So I'll pose a number of questions to, to the panelists um, and then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes then um, from about 12 o'clock for question and answers. Now, just in terms of the format, um, and apologies just before I go on, Alan Kelly then is going to join us and just will provide a, a response to this morning's panel at about 20 past 12. Um, just in terms of a bit of housekeeping, um, just to note, this is a recorded event. So if anyone's coming in um, with, with questions, just to note that piece. Um, we are also going to stream this event on our Facebook page, which is the reason why we're recording it. Um, we will take questions and answers just as I've outlined there. But equally, in the meantime, there's a chat function that has been sent up. Um, set up and it's just it should be to the right of your screen so any questions um, attendees have you can put them into the chat in the meantime um, but I'll come back and ask questions from the floor as well now Carl Hayden from head office is going to facilitate bringing people in, in to ask um, questions and just the last thing before I introduce the first speaker we do have a, a Twitter page um, and if you'd like to go over um, to our Twitter page while, while um, you're participating in the event. I, I suppose if you're looking for a pro-worker Twitter page on, on May Day, uh, that's certainly the, the page to follow, but we, we'll also be um, streaming or tweeting about today's um, uh, event and the contributions. So just to start, um, Eilish, I might come to yourself first, if you don't mind, just to ask you an initial question. Um, yeah. Obviously, as an early education um, professional, there, there has been no option to work from home in terms of something that I've touched on earlier. Um, you might talk us through briefly um, the impact COVID has, uh, has had on early education um, and, and from, from a worker's perspective, um, but in particular, some uh, of the main uh, effects um, th that you've seen as a professional during the pandemic. You might um, talk us through briefly some of those issues that have come up um, while working during COVID, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I, we opened our doors last August and thankfully we have been able to remain open. Um, but I know our main goal when we came back was to help our families offer them stability 
and help our children still thrive during a pandemic. So we really focused on their development and well-being and we wanted to keep it as normal as possible within our service for those children. Um, I think there was one thing that hit me is that all of our parents were so thankful when we came back and we opened our doors and the children came in and they had that normality within um, the service all the time. And it was just lo so lovely to offer that to them. Um, but I suppose before I came back, um, like I had to change all my policies, so I had to change all my procedures. Um, I have a folder that I keep everything in. And on the October bank holiday, that uh, folder broke under the strain of everything. I had to write down to make sure that we were keeping everybody safe. Um, a lot of risk assessments. We completely changed our service as in we had pods now. Um, we had different entry points. We had different exit points for the, the pods. We um, There was a lot of washing of hands. Um, and um, we just kept everybody kind of separate. So we staggered start times and, and finish times. And um, But it has kept us, it has kept us very safe. So um, we actually just had a two-slit inspection and she was commenting on how well the children were washing their hands. Um, but yeah, so thankfully, it you know, we, we've kept everybody safe so far. But we always do these goals at the beginning of the year. So you have your short term goals, your medium term goals and your long term goals. And on my long term goal, it just had to remain open and keep everybody safe. So hopefully we can continue that for the next I think we've eight weeks to go. So fingers crossed we get there. And just something you had mentioned to me previously, Eilish, was around obviously trying to adapt to the current needs of COVID. So the need yeah. to have PPE yeah. um, issues from an early education point of view around affordability of PPE, obviously yeah. in terms of the rate of pay that that is across early education. Because obviously it's not the rate of pay uh, isn't significant. And, and that's something certainly um, we're aware of as a result of the Big Sur campaign. So you might just bring us through some of yeah. those points as well, if you so, don't mind. 61% uh, of our Sector is actually earning under the living wage of 12 30 an hour. We have no entitlement to sick pay, but yeah, we are frontline and we don't wear PPE. Now, they've recently changed the uh, the department recently changed around that saying um, you could wear your mask if it didn't affect the early learning and care of small children. I'm dealing with three and four year olds, and even when I'm wearing my mask at the door with the parents, they find it very hard to understand me. So that was something that, you know, we couldn't get our heads around so that like we were in there, we were exposed to this and yet we couldn't, you know, we, we weren't entitled to sick pay. And most of us, um, like I'm a manager, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on good money now, but I've had to work up to that and I got my degree for that. But as I said, most of our sector is on under that um, living wage that the government recommend. So, um, you know, that was quite hard to fathom. And I think Michal Martin, I think in the budget, I think before the budget, he came out and said, "Childcare, you are now frontline. You are essential." And the budget came out, and there wasn't a mention of us. And we were like, "Hmm, that's very strange," you know. So, um, but I think through the Big Star campaign, we have definitely, um, we've definitely, more, we're more organised now. We've more organised ourselves, and um, they've certainly campaigned for us to, um, you know, to, you know, the the government have paid eighty percent of our wages for the last year. And we've gotten a taste of what a nationalised sector looks like. And I do think that's the way forward. And I think the Citizens Assembly agreed with that. And when I saw that, I went, absolutely, this is the way forward for childcare. No, and that's great, Irish. And I, I know there's a few um, bits and pieces that it's cer certainly Marie will come in, um, in particular around the, the sick leave um, bill that uh, Marie had brought forward. But just before coming to yourself, Marie, Luke, you might just come in if you don't mind, because obviously in, in terms of the sector that you're working in, in, in the hospitality sector, um, you, you've had quite a similar experience in terms of uh, responding to the stop start nature um, in, in line with the government, um, uh, I, I suppose, instruction around reopening and, and certainly closing. That certainly, I imagine, have brought new issues and, and concerns for workers working across the hospitality sector. You might talk us through that a little bit in particular and the likes of um, you know, the COVID unemployment payment and how that might even affect in terms of uh, pay payment of, of rent is, is another particular issue that has come up as well for workers. So if you don't mind, Luke, coming in on some of those issues. 
Yeah, no problem, Lisa. Thanks, thanks for, for that and thanks for having me on. Um, I suppose the, the entire of my industry has completely transformed in the last 14 months. And I suppose at the start, it's important to bear in mind that I've had friends and, and uh, people I worked in the past who have been unemployed since this began in, in March, who, who at no point um, were able to, to restart work if they were in dry pubs and, and that type of thing, you know. Um, when, you know, it, it's, it's, I suppose the other challenge is, is like our product that we serve has completely changed the nine euro meal, the no seats at the bar, the social distancing completely transforms what, what, what we, the product we offer and, you know, how many staff we're able to hire. Um, you know, we've had, we've had to deal with PPE and, and ensuring that our staff and, and customers are safe. Do you know, there, there's definitely an, an onus on, on not only ensuring that your staff are, are safe and feel comfortable coming back to work, but also that a customer walking past the street feels comfortable walking into your premises. So um, there is all, all, all that, that that's completely, you know, something we would never ever have had to, to fathom uh, pre uh, the start of 2020. Um, in terms of, of, of stop opening and closing, I suppose when we closed in, in March last year, we were gearing up for, for potentially a Paddy's Day in the start of the season. You know, January and February are the quietest days of the month uh, or days of the months of the year down here in Clarny. So you're kind of gearing up, you're hiring new staff, getting ready for what's going to be, you know, a, a busy season. And, and Paddy's Day is that traditionally that starting gun and it never went off. And suddenly we were all um, unemployed and, and uh, Eilish made some great points about the the living wage but if you're on minimum wage or or something close to a living wage you know a lot of a lot of people i know would be on between 11 and 12 euros and in, in that region and going moving on to P, to the pup payment and, and 350 was it was a huge hit and then that idea of uncertainty at the start of it all where we didn't know how long would be shut for would it be two weeks three weeks a couple of months you know uh, and all the talk about the government and, and again a, a really good point that Eilish made about this idea that we're all going to be looked after we're all in this together everyone was 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 you know solidarity forever at the start um, until suddenly it came to issues around payment of rent and everything and it was clear um, that the government were going to look after landlords and those with with the vested interest in the in the economy and they were going to leave workers behind and then particularly when we look if you remember in the summer we, we we moved to doing takeaway towards the end of the first lockdown and we started bringing people back to work and in that period during the summer when we started feeling like there was a light at the end of the tunnel then which is kind of ironic thinking about it now but the during the talks around government formation um often what you know the pup payment came under attack this idea that it was it was going to leave workers not not motivated to come back to work and and all this and thinking this is is, is crazy the idea that that any one of my colleagues staff that i had to, to to tell them they didn't have a job anymore and then try and bring back didn't want to come back because they would rather be at home is just insulting to the workers, you know, and and that's what we as as trade unionists and as people in the Labour Party, you know, that's who who we're here we're here to represent. Um, so I suppose you know it, it has, and and if you know, and that particularly showed after the second lockdown when we were reopening before Christmas, when I think everyone thought this was this was a bit mad. <laughs> this reopening before Christmas, and you're asking people to come back, and and there was the general feeling that we were going to be closed again in January. So you're asking people to, to come back in and give up their Christmas Eve, their New Year's Eve, their Stephen's Day with their friends and family to come in and potentially expose themselves to, to, to a virus. So for us, that was a huge challenge trying to, you know, we had to, we had to look at what, you know, renegotiate what we were going to be paying the staff to bring them back on. We had to look at, at, at the safety issues we were going to put in. So it, it, it completely um, turned on its head the whole nature of, of hospitality in, in, in particularly in down in Kerry where I am, which is, you know, I mean, we've always been associated with tourism uh, and that type of thing, but it's never been, we've never been as dependent on it as we have been in the last 20 years. You know, native industry and, and agriculture and other economic forms have really fallen away completely in, 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 in rural Ireland. And we're so dependent on the seasonal hostility trade. And at the core of that should be the worker, you know, um, I suppose. No. Yeah, really important points that you have made, Luke. And Marie, just to come to yourself, um, because obviously there was a lot um, discussed there in terms of making sure that we safeguard and, and put in provisions to ensure that workers are safe. Um, you've done quite a lot in, in terms of progressing a bill around um, sick leave. This is actually something that we've had a brief conversation ourselves in terms of even before COVID, um, the, the prospect of looking at a bill that would uh, make provision for sick leave was something that probably we we'd never would have moved in, into that territory. So it, it's a great opportunity to take around ensuring that we talk about sick leave for workers. So you might come in on some of the, on some of the great work that you've been doing um, in that regard. 
Okay, and, and, and the first thing to say is I'm, I'm delighted to be here today and it's brilliant to see that there's such a great uh, turnout or tune in uh, for, for this session and, and, and well done to all involved in, uh, in, 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 in this event today and a happy May Day to you all. I see the comments there, they're coming in from all over the country and indeed abroad as well. So I suppose, look, to answer your question with regards to sick pay in particular, and, you know, and very much to pay, pay tribute to Patricia King and uh, um, who was a former colleague of mine going back many years and, 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 and you know, others within SIP2 and indeed other unions who last summer were, you know, Congress and, and SIP2 and other unions talking about the lack of, of sick pay in this country. And of course, Ireland stands, you know, um, as, as just one of five EU member states that does not have a statutory right to, to paid sick leave. And it's interesting, Luke was talking there about the PUP payment and, you know, this um, assertion from some quarters that people may get comfortable on the PUP payment or may not go back to work. Well, you know, when we look at uh, the level of the PUP payment and look, you know, it, 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 it certainly, uh, it was significantly higher than the unemployment benefit. There's no doubt about that. It's still only 48% of median earnings in this country. And, you know, the, the, the COVID illness benefit was set at the same rate as the PUP payment. And, and so, you know, when we started talking about, when we published our bill last September, in response to what the unions were saying, um, you know, this repeatedly came back to us, well, sure, we have the, the COVID illness benefit, isn't that enough? And of course it's not, because, you know, we know in particular for low paid workers, they don't have a margin you know, of comfort. So if they're losing 20 euros, 50 euros or 100 euros in a week or in a month, um, they can't afford that, um, be it in terms of rent or in terms of childcare costs or in terms of the, any other um, uh, outgoings that, that a family have. So so I think um, there, there, is, there is no doubt that the, the need for, for paid sick leave is enormous. And Eilish obviously talked about the lack of it within uh, the, 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 the childcare sector. And I know Big Start uh, and the, 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 the survey last year talked about just how few within the childcare sector have it. And, you know, within Red Meat, we know it's, it, it's, it's only about one in 10. And, and, and overall across the, the private sector, it's on around half of all workers. So we see that there's an absolute need for this. Unfortunately, uh, when we brought our bill forward in the Dáil, um, the government at the time voted to postpone the passing of the second stage by six months. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I suppose as of yet, we still haven't seen anything from the government. Now, I know there's a process uh, and I know there has been a commitment and I know Patricia King is, is working very hard in the background uh, on, on ensuring that we get the right sick pay bill. Um, but, but certainly, I suppose, you know, I think there is a, a, an impatience and a frustration that we don't have it yet, uh, particularly when we look at the numbers of COVID outbreaks and cases uh, within some of those sectors where there are real concerns about conditions within the workplace, but also conditions in terms of um, workers' uh, living conditions. And, you know, if we look, I think there was 1,700 uh, COVID cases in the food processing, meat production, and commercial sector, so encompassing some retail uh, between August and and, 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 and and the start of March. And that's an exceptionally high number. And while we know workplaces have upped their game, um, you know, low pay um, and people's financial circumstances mean that they are living in all sorts of cramped conditions, um, that they're, you know, uh, facing that terrible choice when they develop symptoms between whether they can go to work or whether they should stay at home and be out of pocket. So, um, so I suppose, look, you know, sick pay was obviously one of the bills that we brought forward. We also had a, a working from home bill as well. And I suppose, Lisa, just you might you might be asking about this later, so I might as well just just get it in now. But I suppose, and obviously, I know it was covered in the in in you know. Congress were very much talking about this and the Financial Services Union about the right to disconnect, about putting in place proper um, provisions for those working from home, because the figures are very stark. Just under 5% of the workforce were in the main working full time from home um, prior to the pandemic. That by the end of last year, that rose to um, uh, just short of 30 percent. Now, some of that 30 percent obviously would be back in the office, but I think we're going to have a, a hybrid model of, of, of working into the future. And of course, that poses all sorts of challenges with regards to 
the ability to organize with regards to how cohesive a workforce is, communication, innovation, um, and also in terms of, uh, you know, I, I suppose, protecting workers, because obviously if you're working from your back bedroom, um, the, you know, it, 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 it's a situation ripe for exploitation, uh, both in terms of being made to work very long hours uh, and that sense of being always on, but also that sense of not having your colleagues alongside you um, when, when, when a worker is being singled out. So I think there's enormous challenges, but there's opportunities in terms of the working from home space. No, that's great, um, Marie, and, and many thanks for your con contribution. Um, just to go to yourself, Patricia, um, obviously the Congress has done has completed extensive work around the no going back document. And, and just one thing um, that really struck me in, in terms of it was looking to redefine that when we come out of, of COVID and, and when we come through the other end of it, that it's not a politics of austerity that we should be talking about. It's around what kind of new economic model we can have, which I think is really important in terms of making sure, and I, the document well um, has a great title in terms of no going back. So you might sp uh, speak through some of the uh, main components of that document, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Lisa, and good morning, everybody, and happy May Day. Um, and it's a nice, bright, sunny morning in Wicklow anyway. I don't know about everywhere else. Um, there are, I think the pandemic um, and other uh, panelists have said it, you know, has really highlighted um, what our labour force is made up of, a, a large proportion of frontline and essential workers, uh, some of whom, um, I think it was President Higgins uh, coined the phrase, are undervalued and underpaid, and that's their profile. And indeed, uh, just before I get into the body of the no going back, I just mentioned I was in the rooms at the very early stages of the when the pandemic hit first in the early weeks of it. I was in the rooms with in government departments and so on. We have this Labour Employer Economic Forum and, and being in there, it was quite uh, startling to see those people, very senior officials, very senior politicians in a room um, having to understand that the private sector made no contribution whatsoever or very little contribution uh, to the whole sick pay issue. And that if a worker in a meat factory uh, was became ill, they couldn't afford to be sick. And, and, and they couldn't they couldn't get their heads around that. That was and we had real tough discussions trying to get that up to 350, I can tell you. Uh, I remember having an appalling, uh, dreadful exchange um, with a very senior official about the level of payment on that. Uh, and and uh, so, so all of that. And the other thing I want to mention is um, Congress were very early in off the blocks in relation to developing a return to work pro safety protocol. And I think it's worth mentioning it uh, because uh, firstly, nobody else, no employer, none of the state agencies wanted to do it. They would never admit that now, but that is a fact. And that the apps, the, in fairness to the construction side, they did, uh, but the rest of them didn't. And in, indeed, our own state agency of health and safety, we had a shocking uh, obstacles we met there in terms of very senior people saying, no, uh, COVID wasn't really, uh, couldn't be uh, regarded as a reportable disease and all of that good stuff. Now, the safety protocol had, has an interesting feature in it, which we fought hard to get, which is that every work, workplace should have a worker representative. And the reason for that is that every worker uh, should be entitled not just to depend on the management to keep them safe, but that their voice can be legitimately uh, heard and there is an obligation on the employer to hear that. And, and actually, there's an obligation on workers to highlight where there is non-compliance to keep everybody safe. And I would just say on returning to work as this pandemic may be uh, going to dissipate by virtue of vaccination and so on, um, and people return to, uh, to, to go back to work in stages. We shouldn't forget that this will only be kept at bay if we have compliance with these um, uh, rules and regulations, whether it's PPE, whether it's social distancing, whether whatever it is. And there's quite a bit of resistance among employers, certainly with some employers in some of the areas, about complying with that. The other thing to say to you is that the PUP and uh, temporary wage subsidy pieces are highlighted as the state having to pay all of this money. And this is, comes out in media and everywhere else. Well, I'll just say to you, we've done some facts and figures in relation to the subsidies to employers. And the subsidies to employers is more. And they have thrown the money into them. 
And uh, I mean, it's 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 uh, a lot of these companies now are actually operating uh, completely on taxpayers' money. That's the reality of it. And I think that you know non-compliance with the rules and regulations is is appalling when they don't uh, when they don't comply with them. So so we're engaged on a regular basis in relation to that. Um, the no saying to everybody we've had we have had we're in the middle of a pandemic all of the previous uh, rules and policies and everything else are are sort of nonsensical now you need we're never going back there again we need to get ourselves uh, and have a good order about how we're going to manage our society and our economy into the future and basically what we said was it's no longer tenable to be advocating a two-tier health system we need uh, an open access to a health system uh, that is uh, free at the point of entry and that everybody gets the same service. We saw all the debacle about the fighting between private hospitals wanting to treat private patients over and above public ones in the midst of this pandemic. Mind you, there was silence in the last number of months. Why? Because the HSE didn't ask them to do the same thing as they did uh, the first time and they were able to treat their patients. And so therefore they didn't complain. But uh, I think all of that we, we, we now have, and I think we have societal backing for that type of housing. I, I know I have a particular, um, maybe uh, sort of a, a thing about this, but my judgment is we have to get that right to housing into the constitution. And I'll tell you the reason I think that very briefly is because we're continuing to see the same old, same old policies to try and uh, deal with the housing. And, and, and it won't work until we get public housing on public land and get a major and get the investment steered into that direction. But one of the reasons for that is that the state, all of the people at a very senior level who are charged with coming up with those policies and developing those policies, they don't see themselves having the same imperative as, as they would if it was a right within the constitution. And we really have to get our heads around the necessity because that is what will impel people to go and fix the housing issue once and for all. The ingredients to fix it are there. We have plenty of public land. We have plenty of state money to do it. We're a wealthy country. So it's not about, it's about getting the imperative from the people who draw up the policy to go and do it. And, and that would come from a right to housing in the constitution because they couldn't deny it. Um, in terms of the early years, and Ailish has dealt with that very well, um, from our point of view, uh, and the unions, particularly SIP2 over many years, was involved in the organizing workers so that we can now have, and we see sight now of a joint labor committee. We see sight now of, uh, and Congress obviously have been involved in coordinating that. And we see, but you know, from our point of view, uh, getting a JLC will bring some level of certainty and continuity to more decent rates of pay for people working in childcare. And I'll just add in there, we're starting now, I think, a stronger campaign in relation to nursing homes, because, I mean, the debacle that was, uh, you know, highlighted during the course of the pa uh, pandemic in relation to how workers are treated in nursing homes. There is an area that we, we have an opportunity in my judgment, and it would be a, a major miss uh, if we didn't uh, go in and try and, and deal with that. On the collective bargaining and workers' rights, let's face it, I think it's now becoming a generally accepted um, piece all over, whether it's IMF, World Bank, or whatever, that uh, where people and workers earn a decent wage, Productivity levels rise. People are much less likely to leave the organisation. You get much better consistency and continuity and so on. It took them a long time to realise that. But it's now, it seems, even across America, you hear Biden saying it. Just, it's much more about the stakeholder rather than the shareholder. So from our point of view, now we have particular difficulties in this country. Firstly, we have, um, uh, we have a low pay sector. We have a number of economies rolled into one. And the low pay sectors, accommodation, food, hospitality, all of those, they're holding on very tight, uh, not to have anything to do with trade unions and not have anything to do with um, I, I, with higher pay. I sat on the low pay commission um, uh, for, for five and a half years and the vehemence with which they advocate that uh, workers should not get any more money at the, it would sicken you quite candidly to listen to it. Um, and uh, and, and there's not really any major principled ethos behind it other than we they're not worth any more than we pay them. And, and, and it's a it's a dreadful, it's dreadful to hear it coming across. 
So from our point of view, I mean, we, the collective bargaining issue is, is, is quite a complex. And the reason it's complex is because for a number of decades, quite a number of decades now, we've had a sort of legislative or legal strategy being developed by employers or alongside maybe some very senior um, employment lawyers, whereby every piece of legislation to do with employment rights is challenged when they think it's it's in some way, shape or form going to affect them badly. And we've had this legal strategizing going on now, as I said, for a number of decades. So whatever fix we have to put, which we have to put in relation to the absence of the right of any worker in Ireland to have free collective bargaining and a right to, to have the trade union represent them, we're going to have to make sure that any legislation is foolproof now and will stand up to the challenge that we expect. So actually, I have to say that is one of the reasons why, alongside all of the work that's been done in Europe in developing the directive, it is one of the reasons why I pushed hard uh, with the current minister that we get that review group. Because what I don't want to happen is that we end up with a directive in Europe from Europe coming into Ireland, which has to be transposed, and we get some piece of legislation that doesn't work. We have to do the work now to make sure that anything arrives from Europe and indeed our own initiatives, that it sticks and that we don't get caught up in this legal strategizing of Supreme Court challenges to everything that we do. That's really important because we're done with that. We need to move on and get something. So from our point of view, we're saying, and the final thing I would say to you on, apart from the environmental issues, which are a huge challenge into the future, and Ireland is a laggard, therefore we've left it very late, therefore it's going to cost a lot of money and a lot of other economic turmoil to get to where we need to get to to live within the Paris Agreement. 350 was the amount on, on the COVID. And I agree with Luke. Uh, there was the, then the, all of the uh, dilution of that as the months went on. But the reality is if 350 was regarded as the amount people needed, the very lowest amount that they needed, how is 203 uh, okay? And, and we are going to face, and the political parties, including the Labour Party, are going to face a huge challenge as to how that's going to be handled. And that takes us into the final point you made, Lisa, which was this austerity. Now, I think that the current government parties will do everything in their power to try and cover up what they're doing. But um, actually, it will be very interesting to see how they will manoeuvre themselves in terms of handling the debt, in terms of handling people back to work. And there will be, unfortunately, employment casualties and uh, there will be a higher level of unemployment. And we will get to a place where we're going to have to deal with this. Now, the minister keeps saying there will be no cliff edge and maybe that's what they what they will do. But the importance of the taxation and social welfare commission that they've just set up can't be understated because a lot of that discussion will go on in that commission. Now, I'm sort of saddened that they have confined us to one person. And um, I mean, maybe these will be handpicked people. I don't know. The discussions that will, because they will rely on that to support their policies as to how they handle these major issues. Now, Marie is probably looking at me saying, what is she saying? I'm, she, Marie is an economist, I'm not, as she well knows. Many times did she have to give me advice on that. But that commission is going to be really important that we all take that opportunity to tell those people in that commission, this is the only way to go. So that's an opportunity that's going to arise for us very soon. And I think we need to take it. Thanks. Um, th th that's great, Patricia, and a huge amount of content there. Now, I might just ask a, a final question um, to, to each panellist before I go to the Q&A. Um, and, and just to note, there is the Q&A box down at the bottom if people want to ask particular questions as well. But just to come back to yourself, Violet, um, obviously, there, there, we've had a conversation there in, in terms of essential work, um, a, a re redefining what, what essential work and essential services are. But um, obviously, in, in terms of the early education sector, there's particular issues that, that affect that sector in terms of um, low rates of pay. And obviously, there's a huge amount happening from a Big Start perspective. You, you might talk us through your involvement with, with the Big Start campaign um, and ultimately, um, I, I suppose, in particular, in light of the day that's in it, the importance of a, a union for the early education sector uh, and in particular why you believe unions have been important during the context of COVID as well, if that's OK. Um, I'm in early years, 13 years, and I joined Big Start two years ago. 
And I feel we've made more ground in the last two years than the previous 11 years I was ever in it before that. Um, I think, our, as I said before, I think our sector is more organised and that's definitely down to Big Start. Um, like last March, when we closed our doors, we had no idea what was going on. Um, I actually went to my preschool contract and there was uh, a force majeure uh, issue there. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, we, our funding was going to continue. And then I think we got to the end of April and they announced, no, your funding was being pulled, you know. So I was kind of flapping. We all were flapping around. How are we going to pay our bills? Would we have to sign on? Would we have a job at the at the end of all this? Because, you know, it was it was, you know, when we closed our doors on the 12th of March, we all kind of skipped out thinking this was two weeks. Woo-hoo. I was doing my thesis at the time. I was going, I can get it finished. Um, and then I think the reality kicked in very fast that this was going to be a lot longer than two weeks. And um, we all still had our bills to pay everything. So um, Big Start came in. They organized the fact that we were fully paid. Now, if that ha- if I feel if we hadn't have a union, no, we would have been left in the water drowning by the government. They would have said, tough, we're pulling the funding, tough luck. Big Start came in, they campaigned. Um, And when you feel like you're under attack like that from the government and these, don't forget, these emails always come in at about a quarter past six on a Friday where your childcare committee is closed, where the Department of Children is closed, Pubble is closed, you've no one to go to. Um, But but my my um my big start uh, rep is Linda. She's always there at the end of the phone, and you have your. It's like you're you're in this group. It's like comrades together, you know. And um, you feel that there's a solidarity there, that you're not on your own. You're standing shoulder to shoulder with your colleagues, and you're going enough is enough. So through the big start campaign, I do feel that's why um, when they pulled our funding, we were fully paid. You know, and I think that was a big step for the government to also recognize that we were professionals as well. Like we were one of the only sectors that were fully paid, that weren't kind of left drowning. They gave us, I think it was 15 percent of our uh, turnover as well to help pay for other things. And then they did invest 75 million um, into into the early years when we were opening again. Um, And that was to help us to reopen the sector um, safely. But again, it was Big Start and it was SIP2 that were campaigning for that the whole time. Um, like they're, they're in government meetings. And um, I just feel that, you know, we have we have 6,000 members in Big Start, but there's 30,000 actually in early years. And with 6,000 people, we've made so much ground. And I just feel if we got more people in to our union, um, the ground we could actually make. But when I think of the last two years of when I joined SIP2 to now, it, it's, 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 we've, we've just a hundred percent, absolutely. The government know who we are. Parents know our, our case now. Parents have gotten behind us as well. And I do think it's down to the Big Star campaign. We're in the media. They have us in the media. Um, we're on the news. We're, we're in print media. We're on the radio. And people are starting now to go, mm, early years actually are important. And um, we are the invisible string that holds this economy together. We really are. And we are worth investing in. And I think the economy will actually bounce back quicker if they invest in early years for us to keep open, remain open, keep those educators that have the knowledge um, in the sector. Like a lot of us are burnt out at the moment. We've had a year of it, you know. Uh, bring the JLC, give us a pay scale. Um, Big Big Start are really campaigning for that. They're campaigning for sick pay as well. And I think if we get those little steps, I think people will start to go, do you know what? There's, there is a campaign here. We're on it. We, we've made grounds. Let's stay in. Let's see where this goes. You know, and that's, that's what it's about. And just on that then, um, to come to yourself, Luke, obviously working in, in the hospitality sector, um, in terms of the private sector, obviously union organising, it, 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 there's a, a stronger difficulty there in terms of uh, looking to collectively organise. Um, obviously, you're a member of SIP2 and um, you're, you're um, a, a trade union member. You might just talk about the importance and the value um, of uh, and the need for trade unions in, in particular in the hospitality sector. 
Yeah, no, no problem. Um, Lisa, as you said, I'm a member of SIP2, but I'm actually not from, my workplace isn't, isn't organised. And we're in the situation in, in Clarny and it's in, in all over Kerry where we were a trade union town. You know, all the major hotels used to be unionised once upon a time, long before my time. And um, obviously that's, that's completely changed now. Do you know that I think there's only one in the whole county, there's only one hotel that you'd consider um, still a, a solid trade union town. I was talking to a, 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 a SIP2 organiser about it recently enough. Um, and but from that 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 organization base clearly produced um, some fantastic reps I, I know Marie Maloney's on, on the, the call uh, today as, a, as <clears throat> and uh, she's obviously a member of SIP2 but we had a, a Labour TD for South Kerry the first ever one who came out of the trade union movement and it's like Gramsci said you know the the institutions produce or vote produce voters you know and and it's no coincidence I think that you see the decline of the, the trade union movement in the private sector and a knock-on effect on, on wider, wider political impact. Um, we, I think COVID has to be um, seen as a, a, you know, a, a complete switch flicked in that regard because workers know their power. Anyone who, who knows hospitality industry, um, chefs uh, have known their power for a while. You know, when you, when you have that, that, that ability to withhold your labor and you know that, that, that you can't be replaced that easy, you can, you can demand different, different and better conditions. And we need to be able to to show that 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 power that that workers have had in in around the reopening, saying, you know, I'm not sure I want to go back under under these conditions, X, Y, and Z, you know, transfer that into the the labour move or the trade union movement, you know, and and show sell it to bosses as well. I mean, management, trade unions make life so much easier for management. Management is constantly under pressure to try and and you know in, increase profit margins and GP. And, you know, capital will always win over the worker in that situation. Whereas if you're, if you're having to negotiate with a trade union, then it makes life easier for, for management. If you, have a, if you have large trade union organized workplaces in the sector, in the town, and, and your, your place isn't, if you're an employer trying to, trying, to, trying to find good staff and they know they can get better terms at a unionized place down the road, if, if it's not on literal pay, if it's on better conditions and, and annual leave, they're going to go there. You know, it, it can, the rising tide will lift all boats, you know, and I think that's the only way we can we can progress forward, especially when you see the amount of jobs that have been created in the sector since the financial collapse. It's 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 a no-brainer from from my point of view, I suppose. And some really important um, top, topics that you've brought up there. Um, Marie, I, I'll come to yourself now. There, there was a, a, a number of things that I had wanted to, to speak with you about today, but unfortunately, time um, is going against us. But you're, you're doing um, great work in terms of working uh, with, with Deliveroo workers, talking about platform work. Um, a lot of really important, um, I, I suppose, issues that intersect there, Joe, from a migrant worker point of view, and, and you're speaking about those issues. You, you're also progressing um, a, a bill around reproductive leave, which I think is really interesting. I suppose just from, from my own day job, I, I'm an official with Force and we're a predominantly female union. So issues around reproductive leave and how they intersect, I suppose, workers' issues and how they intersect with gender, uh, to my mind, are always very important. But, but you might just bring us through um, some of those issues if, if, if that's OK. Sure. And thanks, Lisa. And can I just say um, it's, it's inspirational to listen to Eilish there. She's an inspiration, I think, to us all and the Big Start campaign, because, you know, let's face it, it's not easy being a trade unionist or being a member of a trade union. But, you know, Big Start has shown what is possible, you know, a sector made up of, a, you know, thousands of tiny workplaces, you know, of, of only a small number of staff and low paid and trying to bring people together. But it is possible. And uh, and it's, 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 it's been, you know, the, the, the well, Eilish detail there, just the, the progress that has been made over recent years. So I think it should give us a lift to those of us, uh, because I think sometimes within the trade union movement, we're thinking about the problems always, but but actually, Actually, it is, I suppose, it's a lesson to us all that, you know, things are possible. Lisa, just to answer your question. So I suppose um, just to, 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 to say to the those looking in today, we're planning to um, to have three. Uh, well, 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 I'm, I'm going to be party to three bills, uh, bringing forward of three bills uh, during the month of May. So next week we'll be um, publishing our ba bill to regulate um, platform work. 
Um, and, uh, and I think Deliveroo workers have been very much the face of platform work in this country. But of course, platform work is not confined to that. It's in graphic design, it's in media, it's in uh, web content. It's, you know, in a whole variety of areas where, you know, the only tools you need is a computer on your phone. And, and, and we need to get to a place whereby people supplying services, those who are working for platforms are recognized as employees. And of course, get, you know, are treated decently as opposed to this terrible limbo that they're in at the moment where they're forced into self-employment. So we'll be launching that next week. And, and I think there, there will be some really important parts of that legislation that will, you know, uh, you know it, 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 if we manage to progress it, that will deliver significant improvements for Deliveroo riders, but for many others who are um, uh, in platform work. And of course, it's a growing sector. The week afterwards, uh, and we haven't really talked about it this morning, but I suppose a matter very close to my heart, which is with regards to youth unemployment at the moment, uh, and we know that 39,000 15 to 24 year olds lost their job last year. And, and of course, there's lots of others who are in the pub payment who are not yet classified as having lost their job. Um, and I think now there's a real fear that we're going to see a two tier uh, labour market or labour force whereby those who are a little bit longer, uh, more experienced will remain in their, their jobs and those trying to break into the workforce are going to find it very difficult. So we're bringing forward legislation to ban unpaid internships because ultimately it's about providing a level playing field to all young people. Um, just because somebody's parents can afford to, 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 to let their, their young adults go do an, an internship, um, uh, you know, sh 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 I, I, I suppose there's, a, there's an unfairness there in terms of um, uh, the opportunity that, that a, a person who can do an unpaid ship, uh, inter internship will have as opposed to those who have to work um, for, you know, uh, for pay from, from day one. And then to, to get to your question, Lisa, sorry, I'm being a bit long winded, but I suppose to get to your question with regards to reproductive health leave. So this is a very private issue for so many women, for so many couples, but we know that at the moment we don't have a proper recognition for those who suffer miscarriage or who have to go through IVF treatment in this country. So it is about recognizing uh, that, you know, people need leave from their work and that it needs to be paid. Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, this bill that's uh, I suppose the original idea came from the INTO and Councillor Alison Gilliland who I know is in this call and she brought it forward to Ivana Batchik and we hope at the end of May to be uh, bringing that bill forward in the Shannon for a debate and there's been a lot of talk in other parties about these issues but I suppose we're bringing forward the bill uh, and, uh, and we very much look forward to that progressing through uh, th through the Oireachtas because you know I think it is something very important as I say, it's not spoken about very often, but it is important and we need to recognise um, that leave uh, uh, needs to be given. So thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Marie. And, and Patricia, then to come to yourself, um, definitely, well, while last, definitely not least, um, th there's, there was quite a, a few questions in now. I, I suppose it shows how much time we could give this topic, that, given the length of questions in. Quite a few questions around the role of collective bargaining um, in, in particular particular from a constitutional point of view and the need for JLCs. Um, you, you might cover some of those topics as well yeah. as um, kind of giving a final word. Before. Okay, well, as I was saying earlier, my earlier contribution, uh, to achieve collective bargaining is a complex matter. Um, and we have seen that by virtue of the series of challenges that there have been to legislation that would in any way have been viewed as offering some degree of right to collective bargaining. And as I said to you, there has been, in my judgment, a sort of legislative or legal strategizing going on here to ensure, and, and it comes from people with very deep pockets who can afford to do this, to ensure that the constitution is put to work to make sure that it highlights that workers do not have that right. And they, the only right we have in the constitution is to form a trade union. Uh, it is generally accepted that somebody has a right to be a member of a trade union, but that's that's where it ends. And at the moment, it's an entirely imbalanced scenario in that you only get what an employer will agree to do. And by the way, in relation to the JLCs, as we speak, the current legislation gives a veto to employers so that if the employer doesn't want to give in to the JLC, then they don't have to. 
And the point that Eilish makes about the Big Start campaign and the organising, that campaign that has been run to organise the workers in that sector has now brought it to a point where it becomes nearly impossible for the employers to say, we don't want it because so many people have joined up and that's the key. So you have to get into a place where you say uh, the employer has no choice. And that's why they're talking to us, because the unions have gone out and people mm -hmm. like Eilish have been involved in that campaign. That's why that can succeed. Now, if you take the points that Luke has made in relation to the industry he's engaged and working in, I remember one of the saddest days I ever had in Liberty Hall was having been part of a campaign to organize a group of workers in a particular Dublin hotel. And we got a sizable number of people in it. And we had the policy, we didn't take money from people until they were organized and in the union and the union was able to operate. And I remember, I can still visualize the room 1102 on the 11th floor in Liberty Hall and walking into that room and 70% of those workers had joined. And the employer was so hostile uh, against everything, just wouldn't tolerate the notion of a union. Those people knew that the only thing they could do to try and forward and progress their case was to go on strike. And they said they couldn't afford to do it. And I remember saying to them, we're going to have to leave this. We're going to have to wrap it up for the moment and see, can we do something bigger? To be fair to Jed Nash, we went to him and we developed and got very serious piece of legislation, which was the sector employment order. He and I worked on that for a very long time and we got it. And the sector employment order is one of the best instruments to organize workers. And where is it now? It's awaiting a high court or a Supreme Court judgment. Why? Because they recognized that it was an extremely important instrument to organize workers and to get them uh, decent work uh, and decent pay. And from that point of view, that, I suppose, highlights what I'm trying to say. The fix for this issue is complex. And that is why I called on the government and they, under the leaf, they, they said they would do it, which was to set up this review, which gets the employers into the room, gets the department into the room, gets us into the room. And at least we should identify what are the problems, what are the obstacles? And then you try and identify what the solutions are, because this is not just legislation. This is a combination of trying to have and, and it may very well be that a referendum is part and i'm glad to see the citizens assembly because we worked hard to try and convince them that uh, a recommendation for collective bargaining should come through and and they have, have supported that 96.7 pe people of the assembly uh, supported it i'm glad to see that happen but anybody who who suggests and i've seen some of the, the thing on the chat the, the, the arbiter dicta in the um, in the uh, high court, the Supreme Court case on Ryanair from the judge was no employer can be compelled to deal with a union nor can a law be passed. It wasn't the decision, but it was an arbiter dicta in his judgment. And those are all really important pieces. This is a complex, complex piece of work, um, and I, I would there is a solution to it. There is a solution to it. We have to find it, and I think we're in a better place today based on what's happening in Europe, based on having got the government convinced that we have this review, and then based on parties and support like the Labour Party to keep on challenging it, because we won't actually succeed in getting workers in all of those sectors decent work until we get those things fixed. And we have to accept that that's the way forward. But the atmospherics behind us, the whole um, sort of, I suppose, acceptance that decent work is now not some outlandish claim to make. The pandemic has helped to highlight because who are these workers? These are the workers we're all dependent on uh, to, to have and to live and to have our lives serviced in the way that we want it. So from my point of view, we couldn't have a better time to be seeking this, but we have to, it's complex. I hope that uh, Congress by its efforts with everybody else that on a basic T sort of team basis, working with all of the uh, parties and, and ourselves, that we can actually achieve this in the not too distant future, because it is the route and the only route to decent pay and decent work. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. And, and I, I, I could definitely listen to this panel all day, but un, unfortunately, we, we, our, unfortunately, we have our AGM coming up as well um, after this. Um, but many thanks to Luke, Eilish, Marie, 
and Patricia for that really, really interesting um, discussion and conversation, especially on, on the day that it, it, it is on itself on May Day. Um, so just to bring in um, Alan Kelly, Alan is going to provide a response just to the panel um, uh, as party leader. So just Alan, um, if you're okay to come in there, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much and uh, happy May Day, everybody. Um, fantastic day for all of us, for workers across Ireland and across uh, the world. Uh, I want to start by thanking you, Lisa, and uh, all your colleagues um, uh, on the Interim Committee of Labour Trade Unionists for organising today and for actually uh, organising our uh, section. Uh, it is very welcome to see this section back up and running uh, in the way in which it is. Uh, because it's fantastic work uh, that can be delivered from the section and it really, uh, for all of us who are public representatives, uh, it can really channel uh, good information and highlight various different issues, uh, always has and always will. Uh, so I'm delighted it's uh, back up and running. I'm actually really thrilled about it. Um, so working with our, our colleagues across the trade union movement, I want to see a renewal of trade unionism, um, not just in our party, uh, but also in Ireland uh, and Europe and across the world. Uh, everyone knows that our frontline workers have been our heroes uh, over the last 14 months. When I talk about those workers though, and in fairness, Marie and Luke and Eilish have really spoken about them. I'm not just talking about doctors and nurses, as fantastic as they are, but I mean the retail workers in the local shops, um, my local shop in my local village, the workers there who kept the show on the road uh, when things were so bad, the local authority workers um, across the country who kept going all the time, uh, looking after everybody, um, and also the teachers. Um, I have to say them because I'm married to a, a teacher and she's watching. Um, so the teachers, and she's a Kerry woman, as you know, Luke. So the teachers of Ireland who really have absolutely uh, delivered for us, um, but also those in childcare, ambulance workers, Section 39, 38 organizations, often, often forgotten about. And certainly that is an area that we really need to look at uh, into the future because uh, a lot of big decisions coming down the road there. Uh, COVID has been obviously the worst things happened in our lifetime. Um, but, and it is a, a but, COVID is also the biggest disruptor we will ever, ever experience. And that disruptor um, can uh, change Ireland. Uh, many people will be gearing up now in the coming weeks and months for, for the first time to go back into their actual physical places of work. Um, but the way, the way in which they go back, uh, work will be turned on its head. And I truly believe the Irish people will be examining thoroughly the expectations uh, of what the state should be doing uh, over the coming months and years. We need to make sure that all workers have at least a minimum a decent standard of living and we will continue our campaign vigorously for a living wage for all workers and to have the right to negotiate with their employers uh, through the trade union of their choice. Um, I see a lot of uh, content online uh, today from other political parties, some of whom are in government. You know, and if they really are that committed to May Day and to workers, uh, they would deliver on many of the issues that Marie has spoken about, but also on, on collective bargaining and all the issues Patricia has spoken about as well. But they won't. Uh, they won't deliver on them uh, to the scale that we need and that workers deserve. Uh, when it comes to the transition to a low carbon economy, we need to work closely with our trade union colleagues as well to ensure that a just transition fund is in, put in place to safeguard workers and communities who are most affected. Um, we'll hear an awful lot over the coming months, colleagues, about the notion of building back better. It's already beginning to creep in. Um, but I'm not convinced that we need to go back to the type of country we had before. Um, we need to create a new and better Ireland. Completely different. This is our opportunity. It's our real opportunity across a whole range of different areas. Childcare, healthcare, education, public services, the environment, work-life balance, commuting, everything. It's all changed. This is our opportunity. 
This is the vacuum that has been created. Um, but we in the Labour Party have a job to do as well. And that's a very important job. We need to regain trust from and re-establish ourselves as the voice of those who are running to stand still. Uh, there is significant wealth in sections of our country. A study from the Central Bank published in September last uh, found that the average net wealth, after taking debt into account, of the wealthiest 20% of Irish society was 853,000 per household. Up, up from 560,000 per household uh, a decade ago. Uh, the net wealth of the poorest 20% of Irish society was just 1,200 per household. These colleagues are incredible figures, absolutely astounding. And they are backed by rigorous research and uh, they are real. A report from Task in 2019 found that a disproportionate share of national income uh, accrues to richer groups and that consequently poor groups receive a lower share. It found that the bottom 40% of the population receives 22% of the national income, while the top 10% receives almost 25%. Tass found that the state's unusually high incidence of low pay and weak labour protections is actually driving inequality, with the working and lower middle classes struggling uh, more to make ends meet. In other words, colleagues, the vast majority of people are just getting by, and just about getting by. And poor working protections is a large part of the reason why, and we've discussed the issues here. Uh, for many, the weekly wage or monthly salary barely meets the cost of mortgage or rent, childcare and living expenses, any extra costs, anything that's unexpected, uh, medical bills, back to school expenses, school expenses throughout the year, extra fuel costs brings worry and concern. When people are working all week but barely getting by, then we must realise that as a country we're failing our citizens. This is where the Labour Party comes in. Working families, working families should be able to afford Every year, they have modest expectations. A small holiday, dare I say, the pizza every second weekend, to be able to change their car every few years, um, that's modest expectations. Not have to worry about back to school costs. Be able to put something aside so that you can uh, support um, issues that come down the line. Um, Labour must, by our very name, represent these people and take on our political opponents uncompromisingly and under my leadership that's what I want and that's what I expect. We must ensure that people who work or want to work are not struggling to get by and see our party as their political home. Both the Labour Party and Trade Union Movement have a central part to play in improving this situation and making change happen to build a more equal society. Work must pay. Uh, if we are truly revolutionary in these exceptional times, uh, then we need a new social contract between the people and the state. That's ultimately what we are saying here. The comprehensive proposals from a good friend Patricia and our colleagues in the Irish Congress of Trade Unions is a manifesto for recovery uh, that draws on many policy ideas that the Labour Party has long argued for. I endorse, I absolutely endorse this new deal and call on others to add their support. Because when I talk about a social contract, what I really mean is a new deal. A new deal for the people of Ireland, for the workers of Ireland, at this period where we know that Ireland has changed, change that cannot be reversed, and we have an opportunity to deliver it. The COVID-19 pandemic has uh, converted many free market advocates to social democratic labour policies that for years they absolutely opposed. Big volta fast here. Uh, some of us were absolutely incredulous, absolutely incredulous this week, as the former leader of the Progressive Democrats, I have you, um, uh, those cheerleaders of the market and critics of the left, had an opinion piece in uh, the paper of record, the Irish Times, uh, decrying how capitalism uh, left, its own to, left to its own devices is leading to gross wealth inequality and damaging society. There you have it. To which we say, welcome to the struggle. <laughs> welcome to the struggle, comrades. Uh, we're glad you finally have seen the light. Um, and I see from uh, one government party, Fine Gael, today, they're all pushing um, 
workers' rights and what they're going to do. And I say to them, I'm delighted. Welcome to the struggle. Absolutely thrilled. But this is a forewarner. People's views on everything have changed. And people are gravitating towards what we believe in. And we need to deliver for those people because when the time comes, it will be the likes of the Labour Party who will continuously push uh, our values and push for what needs to be delivered for these workers. The social contract should be a given. If you work hard, pay your fair amount of taxes, contribute to society, then the state should be there to help you with housing, with healthcare, childcare, education, and a system of decent public services on which you can rely on. And we also always look after those who need us most. But right now it is not. Too many working people have too many worries. Too many people are running to stand still and the COVID-19 crisis has shown the need for a new deal for a safe and secure future. We have Leo Varadkar making promises on sick pay, on the living wage and the right to disconnect. All issues the Labour Party has been pushing out for a long time. Brought forward legislation across them all. Um, when really, in truth, what he's doing, what he's saying, he's really a false prophet when it comes to improving the lot of workers. Because workers are not his priority. This is the same man who is actively working to undermine the draft EU directive which would ensure each member state facilitates collective bargaining arrangements for workers within his country. There is much work for us to do on a whole range of issues. The ICTUB report calls for a universal public healthcare system. It notes the temporary nationalization of private hospitals that happened, which I have been pushing and uh, speaking about for so many years. The Labour Party believes that if we want a universal single tier health system, then we must permanently, permanently nationalize private hospitals to give us the extra capacity we now need while in tandem, in tandem, uh, building and developing uh, national hospitals and our national hospital system and our primary care system and our community system across Ireland. The reality is that such will be the demands on the health service, even in the post pandemic world, and remember, there's a whole absolute different volume of non-COVID healthcare that has been just pushed off uh, in over the last year and a half. That if the state bought every single private bed in the country, it would still not be enough to meet public demand in less than 10 years' time. The private childcare system is failing parents and staff, and the Congress proposal match our own. Now is the time for affordable care and salaries that value the work of everybody in this incredibly important sector. I know it only too well myself. People also deserve to be able to access a secure home, and we can build uh, those on publicly owned land. Uh, we have enough public land to build houses in this country. We, have, we can develop the infrastructure to build houses in this country. This is doable, absolutely doable. Parents should be able to know that their children will be provided with a good education and a properly funded system. They need to also know that public transport will be accessible to them and their environment will be protected. This was not the case in the Ireland before the pandemic. And in the debate on a united Ireland, which is now well and truly up and running, both the Labour Party and trade union movement have a central part to play in reaching out to the unionist community in a fraternal way based on shared values of solidarity and workers' rights. And if both jurisdictions vote in favour of unification at any time in the future, putting in place a vision for what our shared island could be for everyone on this island. Republicans, nationalists, unionists, loyalists. For me, they're not the key phrases. For me, it's workers on both sides. They have far more in common than the flag underneath which they see themselves. I've always, always thought that. And that's that's uh, the vision we need to push. We need to tackle bogus self-employment, provide a living wage and ensure all state recovery supports uh, to private enterprise are linked to trade union access and recognition. That for me is critical. And it is a hook upon which we can force employers 
to do the right thing. These are core labor policies and we'll champion them in the Oireachtas to deliver a more secure workplace. But also we need to think of and look after young people. Young people have been especially hard hit by this pandemic. They've been hard hit in their education and work prospects, as well as rents and the prices of homes. And into the near future, there's a strong possibility of a tsunami of evictions. Young people are overrepresented in insecure and low paid employment, as Marie has outlined, despite a high level of education, skill and enthusiasm for the future. The pandemic has delayed a generation of talented youth from entering into and engaging fully in the workforce. This will have a massive knock-on effect on future earnings and progression. Nearly 60% of young people aged 15 to 24 are out of work, and with young women even worse affected. This is becoming no country for young people. So we need a new deal for a new generation. People are looking at how much they're paying in rent. They're looking at friends in Australia and New Zealand. They're doing the maths and thinking, I'm out of here. It's hard to blame them. We need a new deal for young people. As Labour trade unionists, we have a proud tradition as a party and as a pol political movement. But Ireland, our country, is very much unfinished business. Uh, we have much to do. So we're going to spend the next few months uh, developing a new social contract, a new deal, as Patricia has called it, that the Irish people deserve. We can't do it without the input of everyone on this call and so many other people as well. Personally, my door is always open and uh, we need a strong and vibrant Labour Party. We also need a strong and vi vibrant trade union movement and a strong and vibrant trade union section in our Labour Party. That's why I'm so thrilled about this section and I'm so thrilled about today. I have full faith in this section. As party leader, I have full faith in our party and I have faith in the trade union movement that we can make and deliver a radical difference to improve uh, Ireland and improve life in Ireland in the coming years. And as leader of the Labour Party, I can tell you absolutely 100% with my colleagues, all my colleagues, we are determined to deliver that. Thanks for inviting me today, Lisa. Thanks very much, Alan, and um, thanks for your contribution. Now, just to keep it short and sweet, if it's okay, um, hopefully everyone has enjoyed the, the webinar this morning. Um, I, I think one thing has, has certainly come out for me in terms of why it's extremely important to be um, not just a member of your union, but active within your trade union in terms of the important aspects that we've discussed here today around the importance of organizing um, within workplaces to ensure the collective strength of unions. Um, it, for anyone who, who is, who's on this call who isn't a member of a union, please join a union. Um, and uh, there, on our Twitter page, there's a link to the uh, Congress website with uh, where you can fill in your details and Congress will come back to you with information as to what union uh, could represent you if you're unsure of that. Um, but equally for people who are here, who are members of, of a union, please speak to your colleagues who aren't union members about the importance of joining a union because that is the fundamental way um, and it's been shown through studies as to why people who aren't members of, of a union join their trade union. So please, um, on May Day, we're asking people would take the opportunity to have that conversation in their workplaces. Uh, about organising. Um, we, we have our AGM now, it was due to start at 12.45. I had planned to give a 15 minute comfort break, but what we might do, and uh, for anyone, the AGM is open to um, Labour Party members who are also trade union members. Um, we we might give, it five, give ourselves five minutes uh, for people who are on this call, just as a brief comfort break. You will need to come out of this link and Aideen Blackwood sent an email with the two links. You'll need to join the AGM link, if that's OK, um, just for the AGM section. And just to take a quick opportunity while I can, um, the, this was the relaunch of the trade union section um, this morning, which is very important that the section is up, active and, and running, uh, and uh, that we keep trade union issues close to the heart of, of the Labour Party. But two people I'd like to take the opportunity to thank for their work in getting the section uh, back up and running. And um, that's Jack O'Connor and John O'Dowd um, for assisting in um, re-establishing the trade union section um, because it is fundamentally important. So just to take that opportunity, thanks again to Luke, Marie, Patricia, 
Eilish and Alan, and definitely we will be having more events uh, virtually for the minute and when we can, uh, we'll meet in person and um, to keep uh, collective bargaining and trade union organizing at the forefront of our agenda. So many thanks for everyone for logging in.